What's up, creepers? My name's Kevin, this is Haunted by Horror, and today I'm going to be talking about Scream 2. With the success of Scream, production immediately began on the sequel, Scream 2, which was released less than a year after the first film. Typically, horror sequels and sequels in general don't do as well as the original film, but Scream 2 made just as much as the first film. And part of the reason for this was because Kevin Williamson returned as the writer, Wes Craven returned as the director, Nev Campbell, Courtney Cox, David Arquette, and Jamie Kennedy all reprised their roles from the first film. And it also didn't hurt that the unrated version of the first film was released on VHS six days before Scream 2 premiered in theaters. For the sequel, several big stars took cameo roles, including Sarah Michelle Gellar, Jada Pinkett Smith, Omar Epps, Heather Graham, Luke Wilson, Joshua Jackson, Rebecca Gay Hart, and Tori Spelling. Scream 2 had more satire, more blood, more epic sets, and a higher body count than the original. Even the level of self-reflexivity increased with the introduction of Stab, a movie within a movie portraying the events of the first film. The sequel takes a lighter tone than the original and plays more on the idea of movie literate teens caught in a horror movie themselves. They did this in the first film, but this movie just increased it, going so far as to have Randy sitting in film class discussing sequels with other film students. Are you suggesting that someone's trying to make a real life sequel? Stat who? Who wants to do that? Sequels suck. Oh, wow. Oh, 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 please, please. By definition alone, there are fewer films. Bullshit generalization. Many sequels have surpassed their original. Oh, yeah? Name one. While the opening of Scream 2 tried, maybe a little too hard, it just couldn't live up to the opening of the original. I think it was interesting how reminiscent it was of midnight screenings, which are absolutely the best way to watch a lot of cult films. If you've never been to one, you absolutely should. They get pretty crazy. Um, and they're really the last vestige of the bygone era of midnight ghost shows, which were even crazier. They had glow-in-the-dark skeletons on strings and live performers introducing and interacting with the movie. Um, sometimes they would even destroy the theater or the theater would get robbed. It, it got pretty crazy. It wasn't always like that, but it was pretty crazy. But none of those movies were based on true events. And the crowd cheering on the murderer in a movie based on an actual series of murders is super fucked up. And this scene also acts as a bit of lampshading, having Jada Pinkett Smith and Omar Epps discuss the lack of black faces in horror. All I'm saying is that the horror genre is historical for excluding African-American elements. While also killing them both off before the opening credits. <laughs> It may have seemed like a meta thing to do, but you're just reinforcing a trope at that point. Yeah, there are two other black characters in this movie. Two. But one of them just nopes the fuck out early on. See ya, wouldn't want to be here. And the other one was initially intended to be one of the killers. But after the script was leaked, it was changed, and so instead of being the murderer, she gets murdered. This time around, Williamson chooses to explore how real-life violence is quickly translated into Marco Brule form by the media because there's a lot of money to be made off of tragedy. Though it doesn't really delve deeply into that theme, it only explores it on a very superficial level, choosing instead to focus more of its energy on common tropes of sequels. Uh, it takes Sydney and Randy out of high school and into college, where Randy is, of course, a film major, and Sydney is an acting major, because it's a movie about movies, and they're rich white kids, so why the fuck not? We see how the events of the first film help to boost Gail Weathers' career, while simultaneously hindering the relationship that was developing between her and Dewey, and... The movie really focuses on how Sydney is trying to cope with the trauma of the first film and move on with her life, 
while also having to deal with the unwanted celebrity that she receives because of the Woodsboro murders, along with having the success of both a book and movie about the events. This movie also continued on with the first film's concept of having the most absolutely obvious creep in the movie end up being one of two killers. Uh, the second killer in this movie, however, came completely out of left field. She seemed extremely suspicious throughout the movie because she's a minor character that keeps popping up everywhere. But who the fuck ever would have guessed that it's Billy Loomis's mom? Nobody. The first killer's tangent about his court defense being... The effects of cinema violence on society. I'll get Dershowitz or Cochran to represent me. Bob Dole on the witness stand in my defense. Hell, the Christian coalition will pay my legal fees. It's air tight, Sid. Was an interesting and not so subtle jab at the ridiculous assertions made by a lot of conservative activist groups around that time. Especially just after this movie. It's almost like this movie was anticipating the wave of just fucking nutbags that came right after this when Columbine happened and all of that stuff a couple years after this movie. The ending of this movie seems somewhat underwhelming because it felt like we were just kind of retreading the same water as the first movie. Um, it does, however, manage, arguably to maintain the momentum of the first movie throughout most of the film, and it's an extremely well-done sequel. Well, thanks for watching my video. If you liked it, you can hit the like button. If you want to see more videos like this, you can subscribe to my channel. Um, or if you just have something you want to say, you can leave a comment below. All right, have a good night.